Welcome to the Pitt Rivers Museum. My name is Andrew McClellan. This evening, our conversation, Let's Talk Labels, explores museum interpretation through the lens of artistic interventions. You're welcome to use the chat function. Please do introduce yourself and say where you're from. And of course, we would love you to ask questions. There's a separate chat Q&A function to do that. I'll collect them together and pose as many as I can in the Q&A at the end of the conversation. The talk should last for just over one hour. Our speakers today, Royce and Daisy, are in Hong Kong, while Aiko is in Japan. So we've recorded the conversation in advance, as they're currently fast asleep, probably. Um, but we will have a live Q&A at the end with Marenka thompson Odlum, a Pitt Rivers Research Associate, and the museum's director, Laura Van Brockhoven. So please do put questions um, into the Q&A in the chat. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. This event is a place for listening and learning and for conversation. And of course, we welcome comments in the chat so that everyone can feel safe in taking part. We would ask you to be considerate of your fellow audience members and panelists. Please keep your comments polite. Tonight's conversation funded by Torch, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities will be recorded and shared online after the event. Keep your eyes open. There will be a survey coming and we'd love to have your feedback. So. With no further ado, straight, straight over to my colleague, Marenka, and her guests. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Marenka thompson Odlam, and I'm the researcher on the Labeling Matters project at the Pitt Rivers Museum. The project was conceived as part of the Pitt Rivers Museum's commitment to rethink the ethics of representations made in the museum's galleries and its intention to be a welcoming space to all. The project aims to identify areas of improvement and to trial ways of challenging or changing our public text where derogatory and other problematic language is used. The project can be broken down into two initial phases. First, a review of both visual and textual aspects of the Pitt Rivers Museum's permanent display cases, as well as web-based microsites. This phase hinges on fully understanding the various ways coloniality is presented within the PRM's interpretation. For this, I relied on the decolonial theory of the colonial matrix of power, described by scholars such as Annabelle Criano, Walter Mignolo, and Catherine Walsh. I adapted the colonial matrix of power model so that I could literally physically map the process of coloniality occurring within each display. In a nutshell, I used this methodology to question our process of producing knowledge our reiteration of hierarchies and stereotypes rooted in colonialism and the ways we impose Eurocentric cultural norms. For a more in-depth explanation of this um, part of the project, please listen to the podcast link that has been posted in the chat and we will discuss a little further in the second half of the webinar. However, our first three speakers are looking more at the second phase of the project, which aims to move beyond the deconstruction of colonial narratives and reimagine the definition of labeling and find innovative ways of interpretation to challenge the traditional narratives of our current displays. Part of this also means to activate and mobilize the old labels to address and illustrate the problematic systemic colonial legacies that linger in the present. The second phase is not possible without the first phase, without a thorough understanding of how we continuously and sometimes unconsciously hold up and centralize colonial and Eurocentric ideologies. This failure to imagine or reimagine museum interpretation can be summed up by two processes. A limitation in, which, in how we produce and disseminate knowledge and an underestimation and misunderstanding of our audience. To the first point, I ask, how as an anthropological museum with collections from across the globe and from varied cultural groups, do we expect to showcase and talk about these objects utilizing only Western forms of communication, i.e. privileging written historical and curatorial, curatorial text presented in an often third person omniscient voice, especially as some of these objects, these possessions are best understood by using source ways of knowing. However, the idea of embedding multiple knowledge forms as interpretation within museum spaces is often met with concern that our audience will get confused and not understand the interpretation. This brings me to my second point. We often treat our audience as a monolithic group once they enter museum doors, as though they all experience a museum space in the same way. However, that universality that we prescribe to our visitors is a fallacy. Everyone embodies and thus experiences the museum differently, 
yet our interpretation does not reflect this. A reimagining of labeling is not about a chaos of interpretation, although there's a little bit of that happening, but it is also about creating a space where we always question and challenge ourselves and our visitors, because it's only by doing so that we can hope, hope that we don't fall into the same traps, hope that everyone can find something to connect with within the museum walls. While preparing for this webinar with the speakers and talking about the notion of always questioning and challenging, the words uncanny and unexpected came up. As a museum that houses and cares for material culture from many cultures, I often try to stay away from words such as uncanny because they are often used to describe the objects in the museum. But more importantly, they are used to frame and describe the other within the museum space and reinform harmful stereotypes. If you don't believe me, take a look at our TripAdvisor reviews. The posts there consist of 175 uniques, 150 quirkies, 145 weirds, 130 unusuals, 60 strange, 40 curious, 25 mysterious, 40 odds, 45 bizarre, 10 primitives, and one uncanny. However, today with the help of our guest speakers, Echo Soga, Royce Ung, and Daisy Biznicks, we hope to begin reclaiming the uncanny and investigate how the slightly unfamiliar and uncomfortable is not to be othered or feared, but can be a pathway to new interpretation. We are first gonna hear from Eiko Soga. Eiko is a Japanese artist and researcher currently reading for her DPhil at the Ruskin School of Art, University of Oxford. Her doctoral project combines video, poetry, and ethnography. She's currently doing fieldwork with the Ainu people in Hokkaido, Japan. Her fieldwork explores traditional Ainu cooking as a site of reciprocal empathy and seeks to unpack the interrelations among historical, cultural, emotional, and natural landscapes. In doing so, she moves away from the social and educational forms imposed by colonial and imperialistic norms. The heart of her work is, cultivating, is cultivating a conversation about reforestation and decolonization for societies that have been shaped by urban capitalism centric developments. I'm currently working with Aiko in multiple capacities. Her video art of making Ainu salmon skin boots has been extremely useful in explaining and teaching the concept of embodied knowledge and interpretation. The link to this video is available at the chat, in the chat, as well as on the event registration page. I hope to acquire this video to act as an interpretation to a pair of Ainu skin boots collected in 1900 that are currently in the Pitt Rivers Museum. She's also aiding me in collecting contemporary Ainu pieces as part of the Art Fund New Collecting Award. Aiko, over to you. Hello, thanks Marenka for a wonderful introduction. And it's really interesting to know how, how you vision uh, the future for the museum. Um, so, um, as Marenka kindly introduced me, I'm uh, currently do reading for doctoral research at the Ruskin School of Art, and uh, I'm now in Hokkaido, Japan, um, to carry out the field work. So I'm just going to switch my screen. I thought about what to present today, and instead of focusing on one specific project, I thought about showing my works of works I've done over last five years five to six years to just show you how my um, thought processed process developed throughout different art projects that I carried out um, and uh, the picture you're seeing now is um, an image from Samani town where I'm based at now And okay, so now this is, I, can you tell where this is? Um, it's a picture of Japan, but focused, centered around Hokkaido, which is the red island, upside down in a way. But this is kind of an experience I'm having in Hokkaido. Um, normally you'd see a map of Japan this way, and if you can see a little star, that's where I am now in Hokkaido. Um, the reason I showed you upside down image 
sort of represent my experience of coming to Hokkaido in 2015. I grew up in Tokyo as Japanese, so I've always learned, you know, Tokyo is kind of center of the country. And but as I came to Hokkaido, everything shifted. I learned so much about um, history that I was never taught in my school time. So my world kind of shifted so much. And yeah, so since 2015, I became more and more curious to learn about untold stories of Japanese uh, culture, uh, history, and uh, personal stories of people I've never met before. Um, so I think I'm just going to show you, yeah, how my journey started in Hokkaido, or how I started my my how my curiosity started. Um, when I first went to Hokkaido, I kept seeing um, this shoe made out of salmon skin. And it looked so unusual and weird and beautiful and curious all at once. So I sort of became obsessed with it. And, and as I was visiting different museums in Hokkaido, I also saw many salmon swimming in the river. One day I saw a path and the divergence of the river. The right path was full of salmon still swimming back to where they came from. And the path on the left was full of dead salmon. And then I saw a life and death at the same time. And it was such an overwhelming uh, experience. It's just sort of started to haunt me. So in 2016, um, I went back to Hokkaido and started living in Nibutani village where I um, met an iron lady called Mrs. Katsue Kaizawa. Um, so this lady in the center, uh, she kindly taught me uh, how to make iron kimono embroidery and salmon shoes. Um, and, you know, this, I centered making of the kimono as a main activity um, to be Nibutani, but it helped me to get to know people I wouldn't have met otherwise and uh, make it, working on embroidery allowed me to spend a lot of time sitting down with other elders in silence but occasionally we would chat and gossip and learned about history that never got written in books. Um, I, um, I learned how in Ainu culture, Samoan used to serve key economic, religious and spiritual roles. And so as a result of my stay in Nibutani, I made about 20 minutes video work. And in this work, you see a text that I wrote about Ainu social phenomena centered on Samoan. Um, this research allowed me to explore a wider understanding of Ainu culture, other than just kimono or fishing. Um, it was very eye-opening experience to, uh, yeah, understand how the storytelling is so political, and um, yeah, it gave me experience to think further about. A form of storytelling and embodiment of other people's culture and feelings and how they are affected by societal pressure and norms. So that was my video work called Autumn Salmon. Um, in 2000. 18, I was invited to work and stay, stay and work in Shiraoi in Hokkaido. This is about 
one and a half hour to two hours from Nibutani. Um, I participated in a residency program called Uimam Art and Culture. And during this uh, stay, my stay in Shilawi, I researched the historical, cultural, and ecological background of Nemagari Dake. It's a type of bamboo that are thin and bent. You can see some, yeah, all the brown sticks on the ground in this picture are Nemagari Dake. Um, the man in the picture is called Mr. Toru Sone. He's uh, a bamboo cutter. He works alone in the mountain. Um, as I told him, I was interested in the Ainu mouth herb called Muku. Um, the pit rivers have amazing collection of mouth herbs, and uh, I think there are some Ainu ones too. Um, I was always fascinated by the sound and uh, a function of this tool as a messenger and connection between people's feelings and nature. And so Mr. Sone, oh, and the Ainu Muku is often made out of uh, bamboo. So Mr. Sone took me to the mountain and, uh, and I, I learned using my body, I observed, um, yes, yeah, through physical senses, I learned about the relationship between trees, bamboos, insects, birds, the sky, the weather, and uh, all of this stuff shapes the experience of being in a mountain. Um, as well as my experience um, of being in the mountain, I encountered both personal and historical narratives of the Japanese and Ainu in the town. Um, Historical knowledge and people's stories often seem to me like a mountain landscape on crowded days. The truth often being unknowable. On sunny days, you can see a shape of mountain, but as you're you know, in the mountain, you don't see the whole picture. And on the rainy days, you just don't see the mountain at all. So um, I was quite interested in this experience of what is true. Um, and I felt as a outsider coming to Shilaoi and you know, making Shilaoi as a temporary home, I felt like I was embodying a old radio machine tuning into the right channel. So I made a video work called Tuning Bamboo. Um, yeah, this is Mr. Sone working with bamboo. And this is the video work I made. I documented the process of working in a mountain, uh, Mr. Sone working in a mountain and myself trying to make the muku. Um, once I make video works, I often show them at exhibitions and uh, conferences and film screening events. So this is one of the installation shot uh, from the art festival called Benizakura Art Annual in Japan. And this next work is called Ein Hunter Monchan. As the title of the video suggests that Monchan is a protagonist. Um, this uh, man in red orange jacket is Monchan. And um, I met him uh, when I was working with Mrs. Kaisawa in Nibutani in 2016. And Monchan and our mutual friends and I used to go fishing and going on walks and talking about complication and social issues that makes practicing of Ainu culture difficult. Um, we often talked about the, the idea of ecology from Ainu culture's perspectives. And uh, I started to understand why it's so difficult for Monchan to hunt in traditional Ainu way, which he was working really hard to 
Passu. Um, in, 19, uh, in 2019, I finally had a um, chance to follow him, hunt, go hunting in a mountain. Um, prior to this experience, I read about iron hunting um, to figure out what how the iron hunting is different from uh, general hunting. So I've read books and uh, you know researched through text in the museums, but I kind of really didn't. I understood them. I understood what's being written and you know the tools I know people used to use and how hunting was done, but I didn't understand the spiritual aspect of it. Um, but going into the mountain and see monsoon hunting sort of gave me uh, abstract and yeah, abstract and emotional understanding of it. Um, so I wanted to make video work about that, as well as um, ecology of conversation and words, because as I was uh, going back to a city where I lived, I felt that Monchan's thoughts and feelings have somehow become part of myself. Um, oops, sorry. So I made a video about that. Um, and now I'm currently in a town called Samani and learning traditional Ainu cooking from a lady called Mrs. Kane Kumagai. And she's known to be one of the last people to hold uh, genuine uh, Ainu traditional knowledge and skill set. So I work with her. Um, every month to learn seasonal Ainu cooking. I see traditional Ainu cooking as a site or space to exchange reciprocal empathy and unpack historical, cultural, emotional, and natural landscape of this place. Um, so this is the sea where people get kelp and we made mrs kumagai taught me how to make a kelp dish kelp ainu dish i work with fishermen to understand the ecology of the sea and then i go home and cook with mrs kumagai so it, those process give me holistic understanding of relationship between landscape and human culture Ainu cooking um, is known to be ecological and inclusive. Um, so, uh, oops, sorry. So yeah, I, you know, cooking really teaches me the materiality of nature as well. And uh, Ainu people used to have knowledge of how the cycle of nature. So we, uh, myself and Kuma Mrs. Kumagai often work outside to gain uh, sensory understanding of things that make our lives. And at the moment I'm using photography and poetry to capture or explore how artwork can uh, document felt knowledge of more than human communication among the Ainu culture. Um, so I hope, yeah, I'm still in need of the process how words and images can support this kind of knowledge um, that is ephemeral and fragile and fleeting. Um, which is very important part of what makes our culture. Um, I just want to finish off uh, by showing the image of the mountain in Samani called Mount Apoi. Uh, going to mountain 
is a part of research too, as well as going to the sea. But this was such a big challenge for me to um, walk on this quite harsh uh, natural environment. And after walking in this mountain, I also uh, saw a bear getting dissected. Um, I'm against hunting, but these yeah, experiences gave me a deeper understanding towards uh, spirituality of the Ain culture. Um, so I like to just end with a picture of a beer. Um, this beer knew I wasn't the enemy, so it paused for me. And as soon as I finished taking photograph, it just walked off. Um, so yes, this is a journey of myself trying to understand Ain culture that hasn't you know been part of my knowledge for most of my life but uh, trying to understand Ain culture really opened up uh, ideas about the world ideas about nature and uh, yeah so I'm so uh, honored and humbled to be having this conversation with Marenka and Royce and uh, today. Um, so yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was great. I mean, I love when you said um, the shape of the mountain being a noble. We'll come back to that later. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, and I forgot to mention, sorry, Daisy's here with us today as well. <laughs> Yes, we, we can't forget Daisy. Um, yes, very so important. <laughs> that being said, um, now we're going to go over to Royce Ung and Daisy Business. Royce is an artist currently based in Hong Kong, working in digital media, media and performance, who deals with the intersections of modern Asian history, tra transnational trade, drugs, technology, and aesthetics, and who works with anthropology anthropologist <laughs> Daisy Business in the collective Zheng Mala, since 2015, he has been working on the Opium Museum, a series of performances which look at the role of opium and the development of modern Asian states. Um, from 2013 to 2016, he was an artist in residence at the Johann Jacobs Museum in Zurich with Biznicks, where they produced the exhibitions on the economic relationship between Africa and Asia in a season of show 2014 and mutual aid 2016. Royce has also worked with me on a recent intervention exposing the problematic way we currently talk about opium or don't talk about it um, within the opium display case at the Pitt Rivers. He created a video essay that explored the global interconnectivity of the opium trade, which simultaneously shone a light on the inadequacy, inadequacy and truncated narrative of our own displays. So yeah, over to you. <laughs> So, Thank Royce, you. I so, think you, you can start first. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Aiko. I'm going to try to do this. OK, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. So the intervention I produced for the Pitt Rivers Museum as a part of the Labeling Matters project was a continuation or kind of a, a summary of um, the last chapter of the projected trilogy I've been working on about the relationship of opium to the development of the modern Asian state. Um, the first part of this trilogy, which has taken the form of performances, uh, looked at the no Japanese colony of Manchukuo in Northeast Asia, which um, existed as a puppet sovereign state um, from the 1920s and th 1930s up until 1945. And essentially is looking at the Japanese opium monopoly, uh, which um, 
was operated by the Imperial Japanese government. Uh, and the second part of the trilogy is looking at Southeast Asia, specifically uh, the Golden Triangle, this kind of nexus of uh, poppy growing being processed into heroin, uh, which began in the late 1950s and uh, carried over until the 1990s, uh, which was centered around intersections of Northeast Thailand and Southern Myanmar, or as it was known at the time, Burma, uh, Laos and Vietnam. And the last uh, chapter of the trilogy, which is as yet unfinished, but which my intervention was a kind of gesture towards or a prologue towards, uh, will be about Hong Kong, um, which I, is where I'm currently based. And so said, looking at the history of opium in Hong Kong, um, which is a, a kind of important history, maybe in relation to um, kind of origins of the Pitt Rivers Museum and its collection and um, British colonialism and the British East India Company and um, the origins of Hong Kong itself as a kind of formed as a kind of a spoil of the opium wars um, and which uh, I argue conditions many elements of its current situation um, politically and economically but just to um, kind of travel back to the origins of the project um, and touching on some of these topics about um, the uncanny and uh, how we learn history and how one um, understands and reads history and on a really basic level, um, how does one come from a position of ignorance to kind of knowledge and a kind of deeper engagement with um, these various histories, which are not necessarily taught to us um, in schools or even universities. Um, what is that process? And I thought I'd begin with like the kind of chance encounter with like a kind of uncanny, which um, unraveled this kind of story for me, which was, uh, I was in New York in 2015 and I was wandering through um, the Lower East Side and uh, I came across this statue in um, Chatham Square which is just on the outskirts of Chinatown and there was a, China, a statue quite large um, of what was apparently some kind of Chinese official um, and it seemed a bit out of place, as you can see, even though it's on the edge of Chinatown, in terms of, as you can see the background, of these skyscrapers, and then this kind of unexpected encounter with uh, uh, what would I would later find out was a Qing Dynasty official. And the even stranger thing was when I approached the statue and came closer and looked at the, the plaque at the base, it had the phrase, don't do drugs. And something, I mean, I was, just, it was completely inexplicable to me. Um, and uh, I also noticed that this statue was facing um, actually the Manhattan Detention Complex, which is also known as the tomb. So the, one of the main kind of um, prison complexes in um, lower New York. Uh, and so basically it was from that that I went home and, and did some research. I found out the name of the official was Lin Zexu and that he was a Qing dynasty official who was sent by the um, Kangxi emperor in, uh, in the early 19th century to essentially sort out the problem going on in Southern China in Guangdong in Shamian Island in this uh, kind of uh, trading port um, between the East and the West. Uh, essentially, British uh, opium smugglers were bringing copious amounts, exorbitant amounts of opium into the country, into China. 
and it was opium that was coming from the poppy plantations in India um, cultivated by the British East India Company. And there, and this kind of push for opium was uh, a result of an attempt to uh, balance the kind of trade deficit that the British had with China. Basically, there was a central problem that uh, the British wanted luxury goods from China, uh, tea, porcelain, and silk. Um, but the Chinese wanted nothing from the British. And there are these famous kind of historical episodes in the McCartney embassy where um, they try to impress the emperor, Chinese emperor with these, the wonders of the British empire and the industrial revolution and the uh, emperor was duly unimpressed. And so this was one way for the British to um, kind of balance that trade deficit and by pushing opium into the country. And um, I mean, this was, I mean, I grew up in Australia, I'm, I'm Australian, um, but with a ethnic Chinese background, and this is a history that uh, my, my, my parents may have like kind of droned into me, but I purposely blocked out as a child, but it's something which was almost, yeah, completely unknown to me. And the more I delved into this history, uh, the more interesting it became and the more pervasive it became, this kind of phenomenon. Um, second fact is reading about the opium war itself that uh, essentially what Lin Zexu did was that he confiscated all this opium from the British and destroyed it. And that triggered the first opium war. Um, basically the British um, declaring war against China because China had destroyed the illegal opium and they were smuggling in the country. And I just think for a contemporary kind of um, uh, uh, analogy would be if there were an Australian drug smuggler who was uh, caught in Indonesia bringing, you know, cocaine in his suitcase, and then for him to somehow be released and then go back to the Australian government and petition the government to wage war against Indonesia and to get back his opium, which is essentially what happened in the uh, opium wars. And then uh, have, living in Hong Kong, finding out that there was a opium monopoly, a state run opium monopoly operated by the British colonial government in Hong Kong up until 1945. And that this uh, opium monopoly was uh, the majority, uh, the source of uh, the income, the GDP for the colony for um, the entire, the first hundred years of its existence up until the end of the war when they replaced it with uh, horse racing. Um, and that reading about this led me to researching about the Japanese opium monopoly in Northeast China. The, the Japanese did a similar thing with their colonial kind of enterprise, um, setting up poppy plantations uh, in forcing workers to um, work on the, the Chinese workers to work on these plantations and then at the same time selling that opium back to the workers themselves as this kind of um, circular uh, labor of death um, and and then <clears throat> it became following that trail that kind of trail of sticky black liquid of the opium poppy through history, through Asian history until uh, the mid 20th century, when um, essentially you could jump to this point in time when uh, the Chinese Communist Party was taking over after it defeated Japan. Um, and they pushed the nationalists, the, the Republicans would eventually uh, escape to Taiwan. But there was one kind of lost army which decided not to surrender to the communists and they crossed the border of Western China into Myanmar. And uh, to cut a long story short, there was the beginning of the Cold War. And so the US decided to fund these national Chinese nationalists in Myanmar and uh, as, a, as a means to kind of buttress the expansion of communism in Southeast Asia. But what they did was the Republicans took this money and used it to develop uh, the immense poppy plantations. Um, a natural crop was growing in these mountainous regions. 
um, of Northeast Burma at the time in uh, collaboration or uh, with the local hill tribes. Um, <clears throat> and that this kind of, this became the origins of what was later known as the Golden Triangle. And the Golden Triangle became the source of this uh, high grade heroin which would make its way to the West through uh, US Vietnam veterans returning back to the streets of Manhattan. And the, this kind of drug epidemic would lead to the declaration by Nixon in 73, the war on drugs. And that I found like doing this research, I found uh, this kind of circular symmetrical kind of these circular symmetrical historical moments told a narrative in themselves and this kind of became the catalyst for exploring this research. Um, so it, just to go back to the work itself, it culminated in um, the first piece called Kishi the Vampire, which I sent, was essentially me telling this story about um, Manchuko and the opium monopoly um, that expanded that into a larger piece called Ghost of Showa. Um, in 2017. Um, and the second part of the trilogy, Queen Zomi, focused on Olive Young, who was a transsexual, transsexual warlord who um, was and also a part of uh, uh, the Burmese royalty who uh, was responsible for uh, the beginnings of the opium trade uh, in that region. Um, and that kind of led to the, the, yeah, the unfinished part of the trilogy um, concerning the history of opium in Hong Kong. But uh, yeah, I think I've spoken for long enough. So I think I'll hand it over to Daisy to speak about another one of our projects, <clears throat> which I think intimately relates to Marenka's project at um, the Pitt Rivers Museum. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks Marinka. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm gonna just talk briefly about one particular work we, Royce and I worked on, uh, and it has more to do with uh, exhibition making within the museum context. And it's kind of specifically touches on this idea of uncanny that we're, we're talking about and we'll discuss further. So I'll, uh, I'll begin. Um, so Royce and I, we were commissioned uh, back in 2013 by the Johann Jakobs Museum in Zurich, uh, Switzerland. Um, we were kind of the first artist researcher collaborations to in their new kind of reimagined uh, museum program after they went through a series of renovations. Um, and they were looking to more to engage more with like the ideas around global trade and processes and the cultures around that. Um, and that was due to its own private collections and history involved in coffee and cocoa trading. So we were tasked with uh, looking at the cultural residues of uh, economic trade between African nations and Asia, particularly China, where we were located uh, in, in terms of Hong Kong. Given our previous uh, personal and professional backgrounds and experiences in both contexts, and so, yeah, we had moved to Hong Kong actually to begin this research and we decided to do field work in one particular building called the Chungking Mansions, um, which is an interesting hub for low end globalization and trade between uh, China and African countries. And here we met and befriended um, a Somali businessman and asylum seeker who we discovered actually was uh, organizing Somali fishermen into cooperatives to sustainably fish for abalone in the Red Sea um, after he had actually identified a gap in the Hong Kong market due to the reduction of trade with Japan following the Fukushima fallout. And interestingly, he had a Japanese AMA diver tapes translated into English and then Somali to train fishermen on how to fish for abalone, which for Somalis, um, he told us, um, were considered cockroaches of the sea and held no cultural or culinary value um, to Somalis. Yet he recognized the immense value that it held for Chinese people here in Hong Kong. So it was, I think it was around after six months of field work, we were, <laughs> we were asked to create an exhibition with two weeks notice. So we decided um, instead of 
just presenting a series of documents and field notes, dry field notes, which were really the only material things we possessed at that point in time. We looked at um, presenting a real-time field report and in consideration of the material realities um, that were circulating within the spaces we were operating in with our, with our colleague, as well as the museum's history and interest and active role in uh, the process of global trade, um, particularly existing in this idea of value adding chains, like, you know, as a museum, both culturally and economically, they're very much um, entwined in this idea of value adding chains. Um, so we really decided to activate and implicate the museum um, and take the bold measure of including the museum within the actual trade we were observing. Um, so specifically moving the shucked abalone meat from Somalia to Hong Kong, which was sold door to door from restaurants and the, the nakra or the mother of pearl, uh, which was sold onto China and interestingly enough was sold onto Swiss watchmakers and jewelry makers. Um, and at the time, our colleague was in the midst of uh, organizing a shipment of two tons of abalone shells to move from um, uh, the Horn of Africa to, uh, to, to, to China. And so together with his help and his approval, we rerouted the shipment um, to stop at the museum for the duration of the exhibition. And we filled the entire basement exhibition uh, space with what we, we, we ended up discovering were uncleaned, very smelly, abalone shells and this was presented along, alongside a, a short um, video kind of documentary scraps and a 10-part uh, prose poem um, in the form of kind of, of, of a hell scroll um, and that was detailing which detailed our entanglement and a layering of like what we found parallel narratives so and this included the life cycle of the abalone um, its own trading journey from the floor bed to the banquet tables of um, Chinese restaurants, um, the personal migration journey of our Somali colleague and the research journey we shared together in this process of um, making this exhibition. Um, and we found that the, the, uh, the biography of the 18th century surrealist poet Arto Rambo was quite uncannily similar to the personal biography of our Somali colleague and his own and Rambo's uh, the season, famous season in hell um, poem became an interesting framework to encapsulate a lot of the research and actually help digest and um, uh, kind of sift through a lot of the emotional um, and the challenging things that we all kind of encountered including the difficulty of trying to co-write this poem with our Somali colleague who was a who was also came from a family of poets um, and the difficulty around that because at one point he disappeared and we couldn't finish it so we found the framework a season in hell became um, a really interesting way to really process a lot of the stuff that often gets left out of kind of more positivist um, uh, uh, kind of objective anthropological writing, academic writing. Um, yeah, and I should note actually, one of the striking things about doing this exhibition in, and trying to move two tons of abalone shells from, from Somalia through the Middle East, through Europe to eventually onto Zurich um, was we did all our best to get it arrive on time for the opening night. And actually it, we had no shells on the opening night. So the entire exhibition was empty. So we ended up having this kind of round table discussion around the void of this exhibition space, trying to dissect and discuss the intricacies of um, what it meant doing this exhibition and um, unpacking all of that and the, the realities of the trade and things. And uh, we had a Hong Kong chef um, who was based in Switzerland prepare um, abalone soup um, for audience to taste as we were having this shared discussion between the audience and the museum staff and, and us and a few other um, speakers um, who could share their views on what was happening. <laughs> and um, the interesting thing, I think through this, uh, that, that, that night was like, we had a few um, audience members come up say and actually reiterate to us and they said how disturbing a lot of this trade was 
and we didn't know whether it was the distaste of actually tasting the abalone soup which was probably quite foreign to Swiss palates um, but and then that was kind of further re uh, confirmed or reinforced by the fact that when the shells did arrive the next day um, and we discovered that they were extremely smelly that and filling up a whole basement space of that uh, of just sacks and sacks of abalone shells the smell of having that in a museum space and confined museum space in a new museum space and a Swiss museum space where it uh, it escaped any form of containment. Um, it really challenged people's patience and uh, yeah, olfactory senses. And it was quite confronting, I think, for a lot of people and it, they really struggled with it and it was very disturbing. But then after some time, like just through conversations that came later, we found that they found that it was the sensory elements of both having the shells in the space of being quite suffocating, the, the smell that couldn't be contained of decaying abalone stuck in the shells. Um, and then also just the desire to handle the, the both either equally ugly and beautiful shell, the abalone shell, um, and even pocket it, it really drove home the disturbance and the um, discomfort that came with trying to organize these kind of exhibitions, um, the sensory realities around the trade. So thinking about how the shells are passed through so many different hands or how many, and how they pass through different spaces and actually being implicated in that and what that means when they take it home or they put it on their office desk and things like that. Um, so yeah, I think, that I think it's the it was the sensory um, uh, the sensory experiences of organizing exhibition this exhibition um, around trade was really opened up new ways of um, engaging with like with museum spaces and with uh, material uh, um, yeah material uh, artifacts that you know move through museum spaces or. or um, come to be shared in the the work and life of the staff and the artists and also the audience. So I think uh, that's probably as uh, much as I should talk about so we can have a dis discussion about everything. Stop sharing. <clears throat> I think we're missing somebody. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was, I mean, I was probably kind of laughing, picturing the, um, the like, <laughs> just the, the smell and, and everyone's the way you described it. It was, it was equally, it was equally comedic and disturbing at the same time. <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm here, but ooh, I know. So, okay. You just have to start your video. Yeah, there All you right. go. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you guys all did the uncanny proud. <laughs> um, and I really like, almost don't know where to start because I was writing notes so furiously and there was just so much that I really like wanted to t unpack and talk about. And Daisy, I knew that you might have to run soon. Um, <laughs> I think I can, let's try and, I can try and squeeze in a few more minutes because, yeah, this is too interesting to <laughs> not talk right, about. Right. No, yeah, it's really, and like, I definitely see so many kind of like similarities um, between all the projects. Um, yeah. I just kind of wanted to maybe just start off with like asking, so a lot of all of your work that you've kind of, it usually is in a more of like exhibition and kind of this, um, where we say temporary kind of spaces and I hate saying permanent and temporary just because I think museums have this thing about permanence <laughs> a lot mm -hmm. and, so, um, yep. <laughs> and I don't like that idea um, but for the sake of thinking of the pit rivers that does have a temporary exhibition space and our permanent displays um, I was thinking how do you think like all of your works can really be inputted or embedded I should say in like the entire process of like the permanent displays as well because uh, you said, Daisy, you know, about implicating mm. the museum in like the actual trade. And a lot of times museums yep. kind of take themselves away from that. You know, there are places yep. to kind of view these issues, but not really, I guess not really engaged, but not really put themselves as an institution within that whole um, like linked history. 
And so yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think a lot of my work is how do I embed this into like the core? And if you want to say permanent this space, we can see that, but how do we embed it into like our kind of the core of how we do everything, not just our temporary exit mm. So if anybody has any, any ideas about that, please go ahead. I really liked, uh, <laughs> I lo loved uh, the, the uh, Black Panther. You know, that um, kind of opening scene in the museum where he just kind of smashes the display. <laughs> it's a kind of act of violence. But uh, I think just, just from our own experience, like I don't think this is maybe necessarily applicable to Pitt Rivers Museum, but uh, there, w there is an element of biting the hand that feeds you. Um, of uh, kind of, <laughs> we, we nearly single-handedly destroyed the museum in its first exhibition <laughs> with that show, like uh, testing their kind of logistical and um, infrastructural capacities. Like we spent, we broke their dishwasher, their brand new Swiss dishwasher, putting shells in there, trying to clean them for, uh, so that they wouldn't stink so much for the, the, the yeah, the fine It, it didn't help in the end either. It didn't help, it just stunk up the, <laughs> It smelled like uh, rotten <laughs> clams through the whole uh, museum and clogged up the dishwasher. So I think, um, yeah, that real implication of uh, the museum, like it, it's not, I almost, I think for me and maybe Daisy, it's like sometimes it's good to go beyond the symbolic and into the real, like there's, you don't need to be necessarily polite about um, the way you implicate the museum, maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, going back to the, the challenge of dealing with museums who are still stuck with permanent collections, I mean, um, I mean, I think in terms of uh, how anthropology, at least, can function with these museum contexts, um, like what we're seeing now, and maybe in Pitts Rivers is a perfect example, and the Johann Jakobs Museum is, a, and is another example, although they're quite different, um, there's a real sense of like practicing an anthropology of museums where you can tr at least you know there's a, there should be an encouragement to reflexively process um the different uh contexts of those museums and uh as you know western cultural phenomenon and thoughtfully interrogating individual institutions um and every in every institution is going to be different and uh it's it's, I guess it's responding to those differences and I think what you're doing in the Pitt Rivers Museum is a great example where you can bring people um, connected culturally connected to those uh, the artifacts to um, reimagine or rethink the the representation um, expand on those narratives add to those narratives change those narratives challenge all those narratives because that's that's what it means so, and particularly when um, you know, I think in relation to our mus our ex exhibition at the Johann Jokins Museum, um, where there's still a lot of baggage around the, the privilege of um, exhibitions focusing on uh, objects that are still uh, embedded in, I don't know, visually oriented experiences. Um, and how you, how do you deal with like changing those or shifting those to different sensory experiences? So you know, museums are famous for like putting things in glass boxes, and um, there's a power around that because like you know it says that if you can control the way it's seen, you can control its meaning. And I think museums with permanent collections, which maybe struggle with that, that's where um, you know uh, activities or projects like what you're doing can really at least uh, destabilize or try and destabilize that and begin that process. Um, yeah, I mean, what really struck me, Royce, what you were saying about like testing kind of the actual physical limitations of the museum. It's really interesting because I think the reason that like you that happened is that we, or at least like museums are so much built around a specific way of transferring knowledge um, and producing knowledge is that that they don't actually leave them their, themselves much space or room mm -hmm. to bring in different things. So then when you do try right. to do it, the actual physical space is like, no. <laughs> um, so I think that that's actually really interesting because it just goes back to that. It's not even just about the ideologies, but it's how we've actually constructed 
the entire museum <laughs> we've almost like kind of like locked ourselves into like a corner right if, how do we yeah, yeah. how do we get out and like yeah maybe we just do <laughs> need to take a hammer and do killmonger style smash it <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um and this pit and rivers museum does not endorse special. smashing the glass in the museum but just <laughs> smashing the glass in the museum yeah that is a fine way for me to lose my job <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> that's great but yeah i mean and again like going back to what i said about how kind of the idea of like the sensory i mean i think in all your presentations that's what really like struck me because we don't really have that right as you said this daisy everything is yeah. filled in these glass cases and um we can't like there's no there's no sense of touch smell or any of this yeah. um, that being said if you do smell you might not want to smell all the objects <laughs> <laughs> but this is the question what happens when you do right yeah exactly like what what really like what happens and um but yeah just think how uncomfortable the idea actually makes or they like it in theory but when it actually happens yeah. there's this kind of pushback um well yeah and because th those sensory experiences are often a result of bringing it to the museum so you know it's not like it exists elsewhere like you know smelly shells exist everywhere but once you bring it into a confined space <laughs> this is what happens and you know it really uh, makes you realize so what what is the reason for doing this why are we doing this <laughs> you know what what does this tell about ourselves and why do we need to be caught in these processes and um it, it's very uncomfortable like and, and quite disturbing because it suddenly it really challenges our preconceived ideas of like what we consider valuable like valid or valuable yeah exactly and like why why do we expect it not to smell yeah. once it's in the museum space like, <laughs> that's, that's just so interesting to me like what like, you know it's okay for on like the beach or something the seaside that's exactly. fine but then why do we think this will not have the same kind of smell and effect when you move it into a museum space and that's because we really do think of museum spaces as these almost sterilized kind of Right, right. It's it's purely about the visual, and you just go there, consume it visually. It's it's got a controlled sense of experience and meaning, and it's and that's being controlled specifically for a viewing consumption. And so, but you know what happens when like yeah, you open the museum door and you get a rush of like stinking fish. You're like, <laughs> I'm sure um, it blows your expectations. Yeah, sure Echo could tell us a lot about the smelly fish <laughs> i use yeah. your autumn salmon video um quite a bit in presentations about kind of you know how it makes me think differently about the salmon skin boots in the pit rivers museum um especially because like i mean you go through the entire process right you skin the fit you clean the fish you skin it and i remember the first time i showed it i didn't show it, like i thought you know this is something everybody needs to see and the first reaction i got after showing this at a lecture was that that should have come with a warning it was very bloody and i was like well how do you how do you think fish gets cleaned <laughs> right right, right. Yeah, exactly um that's like what you were just talking about is was exactly how i started my uh work with this autumn salmon uh, project um when i kept coming across with fish shoe you know protected in a grass case I couldn't touch it, I couldn't smell it, but I was so desperate to try it on. And the only way to try it on was to mm -hmm. spend two years so I can, uh, you know, have a budget to like come to Hokkaido from England and spend enough time um, to stay here so I get to know the community, all of that. And, you know, to make a pair of shoes, uh, would require three salmon and if you buy them in a supermarket it will cost like 200 pounds it's very expensive mm -hmm. and 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 also you know initially i wanted to make a kimono made out of salmon skin which requires 60 salmon but for mm -hmm. what i heard from people in nibutani was that like each year they have to apply to fish uh, from local government. 
otherwise they get fined uh, for illegal fishing. So, you know, just to make one kimono is like such a big challenge. And, uh, and also elders who had skill to make salmon skin kimono are dying. So, you know, there aren't many people with those skill set. So, um, you know, we don't know those knowledge by just looking at the, uh, the object in a museum, but it's such a fascinating story. So, you know, I think about how can bring in those story in, you know, attached to this amazing object in a museum. Yeah, I mean, then that like when you talked about how um, expensive it is um, for salmon, and you do have that one line um, when you're, you're typing and talk to the autumn salmon video, and you talk about can you buy a whole salmon in, 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 your, in your local supermarket, I always talk about that line because like I don't think people, like sometimes people don't get what you're actually saying. Uh, one, it is very expensive, and you know, if you don't have the rights to like fish, um, but also the fact that like, no, I can't really buy a whole salmon in my local supermarket. My salmon comes like filleted and packaged and sliced. <laughs> um, so what happens if you can't, if you can't even get that, then you can't actually create, um, continue this cultural practice, right? Because you can't even get the whole salmon skin. Um, and like brings you back to the idea of you know, the museum as a space of activism, right? Um, mm. Which I think comes much more across when you can actually kind of feel and sense things instead of just reading, you know, reading it on a label. Um, and yeah, and I mean, maybe you could talk a little bit more about kind of the recent um, issues between kind of the Ainu and fishing right, commercial fishing rights. Um, so I'm not an expert of this uh, aspect of the Ainu culture, but, um, you know, at the end of 19th century, uh, Ainu people lost rights to hunt fish and speak their language and, you know, basically continue their traditional culture and the ways of living. Um, so, you know, if I'm walking by the river with Ainu people, you know, someone will just like appear out of like bushes and say, guys, you can't like catch fish, if that's illegal. And we have to say, we are just walking, we are not going to catch fish. And, you know, it's that sensitive still. And uh, there are some group of uh, Ainu people trying to get their fishing rights back. But it's been 20, 30 years since, you know, one person started to challenge this uh, new policies. Um, so, you know, as much as the government is starting to support the protection of Ainu culture, you know, it doesn't go with the reality of how the Ainu culture used to operate around the law of nature. Um, so there's still a big process to uh, change um, and also in terms of uh, you know Daisy was talking about sensory knowledge and I often feel like there's a hierarchy in what information is more variable mm -hmm. so when it comes to mm -hmm. a narrative of the Ainu history you know often there's a story of hardship and in you know, a very difficult past, which is of course very important stories to tell. But and uh, but when it comes to fishing rights, you know, the majority of narrative is I know people used to live in harmony with nature. But if I talk to I know elders, they will always tell me, no, there were some bad people who just caught fish uh, secretly. So it's not all like beautiful or dark. There's a lot of nuanced narratives. And um, yeah, and then I find those nuances uh, very important. Um, Sorry, I sort of tried to avoid talking about fishing rights um, because I, I'm not an expert and I don't want to say anything wrong. But yeah, I find it just, you know, a narrative that have 
different aspect and angles that's the important part to me well and i guess that's basically i think that's what partly as you said what like living matters project is trying to do right it's trying to give these multiple kind of views and aspects around like same or same or similar um stories because i think again we usually kind of write it write these labels at this kind of very generalizing um yes you know definitely a lot of times when we talk about source communities of indigenous peoples it's yeah, no, thank you, Marika. Thank you. Thanks, Psycho. Thanks, Psycho. Everyone. Well, thank you for that amazing talk um, and the incredible chat that's been going on in the background of questions, of comments, of links. It's, it's really amazing to see the vibrancy of what's going on in response to those great speakers that Marenka um, invited in. We do have some questions for Laura and Marenka. Hopefully you're both there. I'd like to start with one from Maya Sharma, um, who asks, um, what do you know about audiences, your audiences beyond them being quirky and uncanny? I.e., do you know these works deepen their engagement and develop their knowledge about museum collections? I guess it's a question really that's saying, why is it important to work with artists? And how do you know? Uh, Lara, do you want maybe want to talk more about kind of from an evaluation standpoint? Because that also seems of where that question is coming from. Like, how much do we know? Feedback do we get from our audiences? Sure. Yeah, I think um, on the work that we're just we've just installed in the museum, we don't have that data yet. Um, partly because we installed it over the summer, and then we were allowed to open for a month and a half and then had to close and then we we're open for two weeks and had to close but we are actually going to be approaching um the people because this time people had to book their tickets and we've had quite a bit of um first um sort of uh, primary school and secondary school uh people come into and also some of our students come into the museum we are actually just starting with uh, one of our team an evaluation project on this so uh, some of that is only going to be uh, become more or, um, more, you know, it's going to pan out uh, later on, but we do know that um, entering contemporary art in the museum has been this amazing um, way to unlock stories in the museum and unlock different readings of the museum. And we've done quite a bit of that, you know, even you know, long before my I, I joined the museum about five years ago. And I know Andy knows a, a lot more about sort of the work with contemporary artists, but we, we know that um, when contemporary artists, and especially when they're um, artists from you know the global south or uh, indigenous artists, they have this really important engagement with the museum and that usually unlocks stories for all of our audiences but especially um, for uh, some of the audiences that are the most you know really important to us and um, I'll, I'll try and find and, and I'll put it in the in the chat this uh, quote from um, one of the people who work with us that sort of indicates how um, seeing that kind of work in the museum um, and the work that is being developed is so important to them. And this is from uh, Dan Lauren, actually, who's a Metis um, Native American uh, sort of, when we had a meeting recently, he was talking about um, how important it had been when he came to the museum with his dad. And they had been seeing sort of um, objects of Metis objects in the museum. And his dad wrote to him excitedly, sent him a text and said, they have our nation's objects here. And, um, and then later on, the museum actually um, started working in the Beyond the Binary project that Andy and others lead and, and Beth is also involved in. And he uh, recently in a, in, a, in a Zoom meeting sort of said, oh, don't mind me, I'm just crying here on Zoom. Thank you so much for connecting Indigenous people with these pieces. Uh, it's like visiting an ancestor for me. And so it's the sort of new work, that work that we are starting to build with communities and with often with uh, contemporary artists that actually is unlocking these stories. Um, and I think the programming for specific audiences is extremely important in that. So not thinking that we can just program for everyone, but actually, and, and that goes back to a question that's also asked, I think, by um, Andrea Potts, 
um, where she's asking about sort of the, the, the audiences, how do you actually cater to different audiences? I was going to ask that question, Andrea's question next, actually, Lara. So perhaps, perhaps I can revisit that because I think there was, I think there was a little bit more to what Andrea asked as well. So Andrea said, um, Marenka mentioned embracing the notion of challenging audiences and encouraging them to feel uncomfortable, uh, while not treating the museum's audiences as monolithic. How is this possible? How can me, the museum address multiple audiences in this way? So I guess there's two there's two parts to it. Can you actually address everyone out there? And how you know how how uncomfortable how uncomfortable are you allowed to make people feel? Well, I definitely think like that's extremely daunting um, in all cases. I think it's made even more daunting by the fact that we think that everything that's on display or our interpretation has to resonate or reach or connect with everybody who walks through the doors. I don't think that's not possible. It's never possible. You know, everybody, as I said, like walks through that doors differently and they will kind of connect with something completely differently. So in that way, you kind of, you get to move away from the idea that however you're trying to kind of communicate with the audiences always has to be the same. And you can try new things and different things. Some might work, some like won't work. <laughs> um, but I think it's just, you constantly kind of have to be, you have to be brave and just keep on trying um, and as Lara said, like if you do kind of uh, pockets of things targeting maybe specific audiences, then you can see how that works. And then maybe it might work um, in a different format. But I think it's just, we just really have to get away from the idea that, again, as I said, that you have, that you have to resonate. Everything has to resonate with everybody. That's just, yeah. Just to add on to that, Andy, um, I think um, building on what Marinka is saying, we do know, however, that the Pit Rivers Museum can be a really uncomfortable space for people. And I think that um, I'm not sort of necessarily talking about people being uncomfortable because of the work that we've just done by installing these new interpretations, but actually um, people just coming into the museum feeling like they can't breathe, that they actually want to get out. And that's often people who come from that side of empire that sort of suffered its violence, um, often indigenous people, often people who have roots in uh, Caribbean, other parts of, or, or other parts of, of um, that used to be sort of um, the part of the British Empire or were colonized by the British Empire. And I think that is something where um, we're trying to find ways to see how can we actually do we need to warn people? Uh, do we need to somehow engage with that so that at, at least what we've done now with the new installations that you know um, have been installed now and that Marenka has worked on as a sort of interpretation and myself and others in the museum have worked on, we, we sort of um, at least acknowledge that there is uncomfortable uh, histories in the museum that the museum itself can feel very uncomfortable. And I think that is, um, and then, you know, I'm sure from the reactions that we've had to some of those changes, there's people who feel uncomfortable with change and they feel uncomfortable with um, some of the language that um, we've used either in our press releases or in the museum itself. And that's what we're also going to be doing more research on. Thanks. Um, I've got a question now from uh, Tamina Goska. Um, there's, we know, you can see from looking at the chat, that there's a lot of colleagues from the museum world have tuned in to this, not just people from museums, a lot of other people as well, but clearly there's there's a lot of thinking going on in museums across this country and the world at the moment about, about how we embrace these changes and how we make changes in our museums to continue our relevance into the future. So Tamina asks, um, to what extent do you feel existing documentation standards, including databases and vocabularies, helped or hindered your work interrogating language and developing your decolonial methodology? I guess that's a question for Marenka, but it might be for Lara as well. Um, I guess it's very much does hinder the work because it, when you think about it, you know, that's kind of the framework which, which you have to enter while learning more about these objects, at least within the museum setting. You know, the first thing I usually do is search um, the database. Um, but if the database is, or the doc, I, or I should say all documentation, um, but if the language they use in there is problematic or leaves certain things out, then it makes that whole process extremely difficult. You know, it takes then even that much more work to start. Um, first, you kind of have to start unpacking the words 
and categories and taxonomies and everything that's used within that database. Once you unpack that, you have to think about all the things then that have been left out, which is just a whole um, layer, another layer of story and, and research that you also have to do. Um, and that is something that actually we talk a lot more about in the part two of this conversation that'll happen on the 24th. Um, but it's, as I said in the, I think in the Q&A, it's very much kind of reminds me of what Royce and Daisy were talking about in their presentation about, you know, um, accidentally breaking the museum. <laughs> um, because it's like, how, I don't, how do you kind of work in a decolonial way when the actual, like the structure, and, and in this sense, the structure is kind of that documentation um, standards and guidelines were never conceived to like, for people to think in that kind of way, you know? Um, and so you can only do so much like decolonial work until you come up to a wall without actually having to like, you have to dismantle those standards to begin with. Great, thanks. Um, there's a question that's just that's just come in from anonymous attendee. In fact, it's quite a few questions, um, but I think it's I think it's worth touching on. Because actually, it, it's it's really I don't know what the answer is, but it's a really interesting question. How far does or is there a risk that the use of artists allows curators and or museums to hide from addressing uncomfortable or difficult collections and histories? Is it, is it, yeah, is it a way of getting someone else to do your dirty work for you? I don't know, maybe that's not the question. But. I'm, I'm happy to speak to that because that's, like, that's actually been my point always in uh, ethnographic museums who do that, that they just let the, the artists do the work and the contemporary artists do the work. I think we do the opposite. We're um, actually really trying to make sure that we're doing the work ourselves also and not just platforming artists or platforming contemporary artists to do the work for us. But we work very closely with each other so that our practice is being changed and our practices are being actively changed because of the work that we're doing, but also we are being challenged and we, you know, uh, by the contemporary artists who are working with us. So I think that's a crucial question and a very good one. And I do think that it does uh, tend to be this sort of, we're, we've given you the, the floor now, same with working with Indigenous people, that when you're just platforming uh, Indigenous communities, like, you know, there's some of the, um, of the, and maybe, less now i'm not sure because uh, i've not been so much but i know that in the kebrali some of the work that was done with sort of uh, some of the um, exhibitions was very much that that you would hand over the museum to some or another community and you're actually very little involved that seems respectful but it actually doesn't challenge your practices and doesn't change the museum from within um can i just say so continue continuing with that question like, uh, yeah, I mean, that's like a really good point. And for example, the way, like, at least that which I we try to approach it is um, the video essay that Royce did um, for the opium case intervention. That's almost, that's like the second part of the intervention. The first part is really like kind of, you know, it is interrogating our own label within, within that case and breaking it down and basically showing all the ways that we are um, we, the ways that we produce knowledge, all the way that we're privileging Eurocentric knowledge and also kind of erasing um, ent like entire histories. And so it very much is about like our own museum practice and calling that into question. And then the kind of video essays and um, interpretations after that are basically a ways to um, explore those other, like those other um, histories and stories that we for all this time have kind of um, been obs obscuring. So it's very much like a partnership and very much of uh, saying like, you know, like owning up to like our mistakes and culpability. Great, thanks. I'm gonna to come to a question from um, Nick Lunch now. Um, uh, Nick asks, how could community authored videos be better used in museums and perhaps specifically in the Pit Rivers? Um, how could community authored videos be better used in museums or digitally? For example, the crafters documenting the making and use of salmon fish boots. Is that, oh, do you want me to answer that one? <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I think this, I mean, I just think that has to be really much like, embedded within the museum. Um, as for example, the um, Ico's uh, Autumn Salmon or Salmon Fish Boots uh, video. I mean, I really would love that to be something that um, is very accessible to people within this digitally, but also within the museum space. Um, 
And so they can kind of really connect those boots, you know, behind this like glass case to what, um, you know, Aiko is actually crafting. Um, She's making it around her own uh, foot. That being said, you know, there's also a lot of concern about, you know, putting up more screens in, um, in museums and how that, you know, might detract um, from people actually like looking at uh, the objects. But, you know, I say partly to that, those boots have been there for a very long time and how many people have actually engaged with them because they're in a case with, you know, 20 other kinds of shoes from all over uh, the world. And, you know, it was only through um, Aiko's video that I really started to engage with them and kind of saw them in a completely different light. Uh, so yeah, I think there needs to be a way that we can balance that. Um, but I think that whole entire kind of process of making also kind of puts people back into the museum and reminds you that there are, you know, people around and behind and you know, these every single object that's in the museum. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think um, it's exactly the sort of um, work that is that we're weaving into the museum more now. So in the last couple of years, you know, obviously Nick is from Inside Chair and uh, we've been working for a long time together. So it's not very useful for me to answer that question because he knows what I think about that. And that is that I, I think it's a really great opportunity, especially for uh, communities who uh, like the Maasai, who've been extremely um, uh, well trained by uh, particularly video making uh, organization like Inside Chair to make their their own videos but also we're looking at how do we you know having the museum so full of objects and especially you know the Peter Rivers Museum is very unique in that sense we don't have like a whole gallery for one object like other museums might have um, where we're looking at how could we layer that information could we bring more more information in so we've been experimenting with augmented reality also and bringing that in mm -hmm. as added layers to the objects on the other hand we do know that there's only so much time one can spend in a museum so it, it should be something that is quite impactful if uh, at all possible because we know people stay for about 80 84 minutes or so in the museum um, so and usually they're so overwhelmed by what they're seeing and then choose what they want to see so I think that is why we always try to make sure that we have a huge amount of resource also on the website and I think that's what the Pitt Museum for a long time actually already is quite well known for that there is that enormous resource on the website which is another um, a bit of the, it is a thing that we are struggling with because some of that resource showcases some of the problematic attitudes towards you know heritage of others and um, language etc. So um, actually with Marenka we're now also doing a um, one of her um, interns right Marenka is actually doing a sort of um, audit of that but um, it's so much that it's sometimes quite daunting. Yes. Oh uh, yeah, I feel very bad for like hoisting a lot of that work on her because yeah, she, um, they're the microsites basically of the um, museum and just like going through them, even just briefly, it's just, I was like, oh wow, that is deeply problematic. And then the problem is like one of those sites then have multiple links and pages. And so it's like, literally you have to kind of keep on digging and digging until you realize you spent all this time on one site and like on one of the microsites and just, it's kind of, it's, partly kind of terrifying and scary that the fact that this has been here for everyone to um uh to interact with online and you just realize that's the information that is out there and that you know when you think of like that's not something that you really want um <laughs> to be especially if it's not really properly contextualized or anything and so yeah I, a lot of work needs to be done <laughs> I, and on that on that uh Point, I think we must draw things to a close. Um, hopefully, uh, well, I think I think that's been you know we can see that this is this is an ongoing conversation. This museum does not have the answers any more than any other museum does, but there's an amazing journey to go on to to ask the questions and see see where museums and the role that museums can play in uh, our contemporary world. Um, thank you for attending this evening's event. Please do fill in the survey. It really helps us. Um, improve future events and a massive thank you to Marenka, to Aiko, to Royce, to Daisy and of course to Laura and thanks to Lizard Torch and my colleagues Beth and Brittany
who kind of help out behind the scenes and then get seen. And of course, thanks to you for coming along because there has been an awful lot of you. So thank you very much for coming. Our next event will be part two of this conversation, focusing on practical decisions in the museum and will take place on Wednesday, the 24th of February at 5 p.m. Tickets are available online at the moment. So please do book in and rejoin us in two weeks time. Thank you and good night. <laughs>